This is the introductory video for the Projectile Motion Lab. So the projectile motion apparatus mainly consists of this steel tube, and we're going to put a steel ball in here, which will roll down the tube and then be fired horizontally out of the end of the tube. So on your desk you will have this small steel ball, and over here, where you can't see it actually, on this side of the tube there's a hole that this ball fits into. And this latch here is going to act as a trigger. When I lift it up, the ball will be released, it'll roll down the tube, and it'll fire out the opposite end of the tube. So I'll do that now. So I release the ball, and it comes out the opposite end of the tube. Now the purpose of us doing the lab is we want to theoretically predict and experimentally measure the horizontal range that the ball travels, so how far it goes out from the end of the tube horizontally. So you're going to need to take some measurements off the tube itself to theoretically predict how far the ball is going to go, and then you're going to actually do the experiment five times and get an experimental value for the horizontal range of the ball. And then you'll compare those two numbers to see whether they agree with an uncertainty. Now your lab manual tells you to first measure all of the quantities you're going to need to calculate the range of the ball theoretically. So now let me go over the equations you're going to need. Now calculating the horizontal range of the ball at first glance looks really simple. It's just the exit velocity, that is the speed that the ball was traveling at when it left the tube, times the time of flight, so how long it was in the air for after it left the tube. Unfortunately, the exit velocity and the time of flight are, are both fairly complicated expressions. So in this first one, which is the exit velocity, we've got g, which is the acceleration due to gravity, divided by 0.7, and if you read through the theory section of your lab manual, it explains why this is 0.7 and then you multiply it by some h terms, I call them. So there's h1, h2, h1f, and h2f. So what are all of those? These are all height measurements, and I'm going to go back to the experimental apparatus to show you what they are. So what are the heights h1, h2, h1f, and h2f? h1 is defined as being the distance between where the ball is released and the floor. There is a little pin on the side of the tube here that marks the center of the ball when it's here, ready to be released. So you would measure from this pin to the ground, and that's your H1 value. H2 is defined as being from the center of the ball when it's just leaving the tube to the ground. So again, there is a pin here that marks the center of the ball just as it's leaving the tube, and you would measure from this pin to the ground to get H2. So before you measure these, you first have to level your tube carefully. That means this section of the tube has to be completely level. So to do this, you grab a spirit level, and you stick it on the end of the tube. So it will balance there, not very steadily, but it will balance there. And then you would look straight down and make sure that the bubble is centered between the lines. If it's not, then you're going to have to make an adjustment. This is slightly confusing. There's two screws. There's this one here, and the whole block rests on this screw, this vertical one, and then there's another screw here in the center. This screw here basically just stabilizes everything, so it doesn't do anything other than just keeping this thing from wobbling too much. So to level your tube, you first loosen this up, just so you can move that tube, but you're actually going to set the leveling of the tube by adjusting the height of this. So you can move this up or down as you need to, to make sure that your tube is totally level. And when it looks like it's completely level to you, when this is adjusted correctly, then you'll tighten this up, but this is just to keep things from wobbling. So once that far end of the tube is level, then you can measure H1 and H2. Now this might be a little hard for you to see, but there's this string attached to the little pins here and at the other end. This is for a plumb bob. So you've got a little plumb bob, and you dangle it off of these screws. The plumb bob is only there to make sure that you get your tape measure nice and vertical. So you don't actually take any measurements off of the plumb bob itself, you just use it to make sure that you've got your tape measure nice and straight. The best length for these plumb bobs is that when it's hooked on here, it's just grazing the floor, but not actually touching it. So if you need to adjust the length of the plumb bob, you can pull the string to make it longer or shorter, so like that. So you can adjust that loop as you need to, to make your plumb bob the right length. So that's H1 and H2, but remember that there were four things we needed to measure, H1, H2, and also something called H1F and H2F. What are those? Well, to measure H1F and H2F, you have to realign the entire tube. 
if we didn't have any friction in the tube, we wouldn't need to measure H1F and H2F. But we are not going to neglect friction in the tube in this experiment. We're going to get a grip on how much of it there is. And to do this, we have to tilt the tube back, like this. So as you can see, I've tilted the track way back at a quite an extreme angle. This is almost all the way down. But this is not a random angle that I've set it to. I've purposefully tilted the track such that when I put the ball in, and release it, it goes just to the end of the track, and it doesn't fall out. It just comes back. So the ball came right to the end of the track, and then it rolled back. It didn't fall out, and it did come right to the end. The reason why I set it to that exact angle is that this end of the tube is still higher than that end of the tube by a little bit. So if we take the difference between this height and that height, we can figure out the potential energy difference between them, mgh. And that potential energy difference tells us how much energy was lost in the tube just due to friction. So that's how we figure out how much friction was in the tube, is we tilt the track back to this exact angle where the ball goes all the way to the end but doesn't fall out, comes back, and then that potential energy difference tells us how much friction we lost. So once you've gotten your tube oriented like this, to the perfect angle, then you can measure H1F, F for friction, and H2F. So again, H1F is this end of the tube. You measure from the pin to the ground. You will probably need to readjust your plumb bob lengths. And H2F is again from this pin to the ground. So once you get those measured, you can then re-level the far end of the tube in preparation for data taking. I will warn you that although I made this look really fast and easy to do via video trickery, usually it takes about five minutes to get your tube adjusted correctly to get H1F and H2F, just because you'll have to orient it back and forth until you get it right to the perfect angle where the ball goes right to the end but doesn't fall out. So now let's talk about the time of flight. So calculating the time of flight depends on the fact that whether you project a ball horizontally or just let it drop straight down, it will take the same amount of time to hit the ground. So the horizontal and vertical components of the velocity don't affect one another. So there's two things you need to measure here. There's h3, another height, and there's r. What is r? r is the radius of the steel ball. So you would take your calipers, measure the diameter of the steel ball, and then divide by two to get this r value. So what are calipers? On your desk, you should have a box like this, and inside you'll find your digital calipers. The way in which you use these is you press the jaws together and you click on. And it's important that you do have the jaws pressed together when you push on because that zeroes the scale. So in order to get accurate values, you do have to zero it while the jaws are together, like that. So you zero it and you make sure that you're on the millimeter scale. If you're not, this button up here will change between the two. So just make sure you're on the metric scale. To take a measurement, you clamp the object between the jaws and read your value directly off the calipers. It's most accurate to leave the object clamped in the jaws when you take the measurement, just because if you take the object out, you can't be totally sure that you haven't accidentally adjusted the position of the jaws. The apparatus section of your lab manual tells you what the instrument uncertainty of the digital calipers is, and when you're done using it, you, you turn it off with this button. H3 is going to be slightly different than H2, so again, I'm going to go back to the apparatus to show you how to measure H3. So here's a close-up of the launch end of the tube, which will show you some equipment you probably didn't see before. So first of all, I have re-leveled this tube to make sure that it's ready for data taking. The first bit of apparatus that will draw your attention to is over here, we have a little tiny photo gate mounted on the end of the tube. So when the ball goes by, when it's leaving the tube, it's going to trigger this photo gate. The reason why we have it there is that we've got a computer program that is going to measure the time of flight of the ball. The real purpose of this experiment is to measure the horizontal range, but we're also going to be getting both a theoretical and an experimental value for the time of flight that we can compare to each other. So this little photo gate is half of what the program needs to get the time of flight experimentally. The other half is that tap pad that you see on the ground. So what'll happen is that the ball will fly out the end of the tube, it'll trigger this photo gate, it'll land on the tap pad, and that'll turn off the computer program. So the photo gate turns the program on, tap pad turns it off, and we get an experimental time of flight that we can compare to the theoretical time of flight that we already calculated.
So just to demonstrate, I release the ball, and we see it land on the tap pad. Now you may have noticed that the tap pad kind of moved when the ball hit it, so I strongly recommend that you actually take masking tape and tape the tap pad to the floor. So do a trial run just to see where the ball lands. You put the tap pad there and then tape it onto the floor. But before you do that, there's something you need to measure. Remember in that time of flight calculation, we needed something called H3, a height. So what is H3? As I mentioned, it's going to be slightly different than H2, where H2 was from the pin to the ground. H3 is from the pin to the top of that tap pad. So to get that, you're going to move your tap pad over and measure it directly, like so. So you put the tap pad underneath your plumb bob, adjusted correctly, and you measure from the pin to the top of the tap pad, and that's your H3 value. Now in that time of flight calculation, if you recall, the quantity in the brackets was not H3, it was H3 minus R, where R was the radius of the ball. Now why is that? It's because the height that we actually want to measure is how far the center of mass of the ball dropped. So this pin marks the center of the ball, but the top of the tap pad, of course, marks the bottom of the ball. So to get the actual distance that the ball travels downward, we have to subtract off R. So we'll go from the center of the mass here down to the center of mass here, which is H3 minus R, the radius of the ball. Now finally, as I mentioned, the most important quantity we want to measure is not the time of flight, but the range, the horizontal range of the ball. So we need a way to do that. So I'm going to put that tap pad back where it belongs, and on top of it, I'm going to put this piece of carbon paper in such a way that I'll be able to fold back the carbon paper and see the dot that the ball makes on the page. So let me demonstrate. So now I can fire my ball out of the projectile tube onto that piece of paper and it will make a dot on the page and then I'll be able to take my tape measure and measure from the bottom of the plumb bob over to where the dot on the page is to get a range value. You're actually going to measure five separate ranges and use the largest one as your experimental range. You should think about what your uncertainty on the range should be by the way. There's the size of the dot on the page and also how much the dots are scattered around on the page. And if you're wondering why there's any scatter at all, you might think in terms of the fact that this tube does wobble a little bit, even when we have it properly tightened up. So just to recap, first you're going to get a theoretical range for the ball, and in order to get that you need to measure H1, H2, H1F, H2F, and H3, as well as find the radius of the ball. You calculate a theoretical value for the horizontal range of the ball. In the process of doing that, you're also going to be getting a theoretical time of flight for the ball. And then you're going to fire the ball five times onto the tap pad, peel back your carbon paper, and actually measure from the bottom of the plumb bob over to the dots on the page. You'll have five different ranges. You use the largest one as your theoretical range for the ball, but the amount by which the other dots scatter around on the page should inform how large an uncertainty you use for your experimental range. And the computer program, which I'm going to show you next, is going to give you an experimental time of flight as well. So in both the case of the horizontal range and the time of flight, you're going to have experimental and theoretical values, and you compare those to see whether or not they agree within the limits of uncertainty. So as usual, you go to the Photogate VIs folder, and the program we're going to be using is called Two-Gate Interval. Two-Gate Interval. So you can open that up. And the way in which you use this is fairly straightforward. You click the one arrow button to start it running, wait for this button to turn green, and then you're ready to start taking data. In other words, then you're ready to release the ball down the tube. So when the first photo gate is blocked, you will see a time pop up here. We don't actually care about this time. And when the tap pad is triggered, then another time will show up here. It's actually the interval between the gates that we care about. So this is your time of flight, your experimental time of flight in seconds. And the lab manual doesn't say, but the uncertainty on this is 1%. 
and then you can compare this experimental time of flight to the one that you calculated theoretically to see whether they agree with an uncertainty.